So at the start of the year 2023, the Aston Martin Formula 1 team came firing out of the blocks with a motivated old timer and a car that ran faster than six month old cheese. For a lot of people, this was a dream come true and the hype train was in full swing. Choo -choo, motherfucker. The Aston Martin brand taking on the front runners of Formula 1 racing, giving the sport another constructor that can add to the two and a half team battle at the top. And Fernando Alonso was in a car that could fight for wins again. But since those dizzying heights at the start of the season, the damn hype train has derailed. And after having looked good for second in the overall Constructors' Championship, they'll be lucky if they can keep fourth. And while the car's development is obviously a bit of a problem, a lot of talk has centered around something else. Or rather, someone else. That's right folks, we're talking about Sir Lancelot again. He has been talked about on this channel before and he's the crutch of other F1 YouTubers. But while we will be talking about his year thus far, what I really want to delve into is his future. Because in a roundabout way, where he ends up going forward won't just affect his career, it could potentially affect the Aston Martin Formula 1 team, their other racing programs, and even the entire brand itself. Sounds too far-fetched? Well, in this weird and wacky world of motor racing, if something sounds stupid, it might be true. Officials Blundering races? Yeah, that happens. Drivers taking up illegal testing to get an edge over their rivals? You betcha. Team members getting thrown out of limousine windows after spilling someone's line of coke on the dashboard? You can put your money on it, brother. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that I want to raise a discussion that one person in particular does not seem to want to have, and that the grand master plan that I have cooked up for them would bring success and elation and world domination and whatever. So with that in mind, let's get into it. Lance's 2022 season wasn't ultra amazing, with teammate Sebastian Vettel out qualifying him and out racing him for the majority of the year. Though it has to be said, relatively speaking to other teams around the paddock, the gulf between the two drivers wasn't nearly as bad as them, and so there was some amount of anticipation as to how Sir Lancelot would do for the 2023 season. Not simply because of how he did last year, but because this would have been his seventh year in the category, and fifth year in this specific team. And no doubt he would have had the full backing of the mothership given his number one supporter. Big Daddy Lawrence Stroll is the team owner too. You can't really lay too many excuses on the table here. If Lance Stroll has the potential to be a world-class world champion racing driver in Formula 1, he was gonna have to show it this year because his new teammate, Fernando Alonso, was himself a world-class world champion racing driver in Formula 1. Even before the season started, however, there were problems with Lance breaking both wrists and a toe in what was, uh, um... Voting accident. I believe it was a boking accident. I have to go now. With these injuries coming mere days out from the season opener, no one was quite sure that he'd return to the saddle for the first round. In fact, really, 15 days out, two weeks to unbreak your wrists. <laughs> no. Many believing that reserve driver Felipe Drukovic would finally cash in on his asinine gamble and actually get a shot. Instead, miracles were performed, his injuries were healed, sort of. And so Lancelot made the grid for the Bahrain Grand Prix. It was evident throughout that he was hurting a lot and had to adapt his driving style to not exert too much pressure upon them recently repaired wrists. But you did have to admire the dedication that he had to get back into the seat that fast, even with all of that going on. And you could forgive the pace deficit to his teammate, given the track time he missed out on and his recovery. The gap between himself and Alonso was initially not that big. If Lance can keep within three tenths of him, then it works out perfectly fine. And for a while, that was what was happening. Then first few races were actually relatively strong. He might not have been beating Fernando, but really, that's not something for everyone. Keeping within reaching distance though is plenty good enough. And what's more, he was reaching the final stage of qualifying all the time. A land and region that Sir Lancelot had previously never even heard of. It would be like Ireland getting past the quarterfinals. Actually, that's not fair. That, that, that was a Manus move from me. I'm sorry. But from Sir Lancelot, this was strong. Not quite as strong, it must be said, than the services of Surfshark VPN. So, as has been said over and over on this channel, our reliance online has been rapidly increasing. From streaming, to keeping in touch with our loved ones, to online banking. I mean, we would like to think that our information is safe, but as our online footprint increases, so does the need for proper security. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet, thereby keeping any prying eyes from getting at it. But wait, that's not all. Have you noticed that content can be restricted based on on your location? That old antiquated means of 
what they mean? Well, with Surfshark, you can solve that problem by simply changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows, but it can also be a vital tool for those who live in countries that heavily censor their people for whatever their reasons may be. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're going to get right now. So Surfshark are throwing you all a bone here. By using my link in the description and using the promo code Josh Revel, you can get Surfshark VPN for an exclusive offer and three extra months for free. Which means for something like a couple of bucks a month, you are fully protected. Plus, you're going to have three free months and a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. So what the bloody hell are you waiting for? Surfshark is but the first step down the walk of success. A walk that Sir Lancelot was trending down for a while, but by the time the Miami Grand Prix came around, this is where everything started to go downhill. In the interest of fairness, it does need to be said that not everything that happened since then was his fault. Not everything. In that Miami race, he failed to reach Q2. Back in Irish territory here. But you could put that down to Aston Martin's overconfidence in getting through on one set of tyres. And in Monaco, his poor qualifying performance could be put down towards some damage picked up thanks to debris in Q2. But then he drowned horribly in the race, hitting anything that moved and didn't move and retired from the race. What was perhaps more confusing was his performance in Spain. That was one weekend where you could say that he held his own against the Lord of the Eyebrows and it came at his home track where well, you wouldn't expect anything like that. Why this was, I, I I don't know. By that token then, the next race in Canada should have been the other way round. But of course, there's no way that would... It happened, didn't it? Despite climbing a few positions in the race, Lance still did finish nearly a minute behind his teammates, and you can't really put all of that down to track position. Then, in the next round in Austria, his pace shot up again. He outqualified Nando, and surely now, surely, this was something to build on. But then he was beaten in the race, and then in the next round at Silverstone, he was outperformed there too. He was bashing people off the road with just, just reckless driving. There was a problem with Stroll's consistency in that there was no consistency. Now, yes, at this point, the Aston was starting to gradually fall behind in pace. This was not the car we saw at the start of the year that was delivering a hammer blow to anyone who was not in a rear ball. But Lance still did have a teammate to compete against, even if that teammate was a two-time world champion. So while the pace of the Aston was faltering, Lance's performances compared to Alonso should not have been. This three-tenths deficit we said would be okay at the start of the year was starting to disappear. He was slipping back into the old chestnut of being knocked down in Q1 before coming home in the race to finish somewhere vaguely near the points. But not in the points. His crash in Belgium destroyed a new spec floor and effectively ruined his weekend. And while yes, the strategy from Aston wasn't brilliant at Zandvoort, he also just wasn't very fast. Meanwhile, Fernando got onto the podium. His Monza performance could be brushed off by virtue of the fact that his car went on strike for the entirety of Friday. But come Singapore, his car did work right up until he threw it into the barriers. The strategy compromised the car's handling somewhat and led to him being knocked out in Q1 one again. Such a crash might be described as running out of talent to some, but to Aston Martin team principal, <laughs> my crack, he described it as a demonstration of his commitment. Right. I mean, hey, I'm all for passion and commitment. Passion and commitment are good, but this seems decidedly unhealthy. Japan was a tiny bit better. Sure, he got outqualified by his teammate again, but at least he did show some good stuff in the opening lap and was marching up the field in the race before his car attempted to convert itself into a Formula Ford by lap 20. But then came the Qatar Grand Prix. He was out qualified again. And in the sprint race qualifying too. In both cases, he was a second slower than his teammates. He vented his frustrations after the session by throwing his very expensive steering wheel out of the car and giving his trainer a, shall we call it, a nudge. Now that on its own caused an uproar online, with many condemning his behavior, saying that it has no place in Formula 1 and that any other driver would have been fired over the matter. Now, it was definitely the wrong way to go about things for Lance and it was not on. But yeah, in the whole history of Formula 1, every single time something like this happened, a driver has been fired. Yes, every time. But these pit lane frackers are not what I'm concerned about. Well, actually, kind of. Because that does demonstrate that Lance is on edge and that all of this is getting to him. But irrespective of what I'm concerned about was that gap in qualifying. That is a long way behind a teammate. And although the season is not complete, we do now know how he's performed for the vast majority of the year. And we also know that he will remain in that seat for 2024. Now, the thing is, can we say he's earned that? I would emphatically say... No, because honestly, here we are in the seventh year talking about the same damn things we've been talking about every year. The consistency issues, the mistakes, the disparity in pace, both qualifying and in the race. You can see where the issues are. You can see what's not working. 
So why the hell can you not fix it? And there were instances where he appeared to solve all of these problems, but it never lasted long enough. Can Lance Stroll be a good, solid Formula One driver? Sure but it doesn't happen often enough. Sure, drivers have bad days, but with Lance, it's more like, sure, he has some good days. People in this game have been fired for better results in far less time. Also, remember that 2020 season about how Checo was let go from Racing Point and Lance wasn't. Don't let 2023 fool you. Checo showed a lot that year. And yet, he was almost out of F1. And was there really a good reason? Apart from the team thinking he was a diva? Get out of here. So, what's my take on this whole thing? Well, simple. Big Daddy needs to bite that bullet and take Lance Stroll out of Formula 1. But for those that are thinking this is some kind of rage and jealousy-induced attack on the lads, I need y'all to pump the brakes here for a moment. Because there is more to this. So, look, we know Lance has his strengths. We know that he's good in the wet weather conditions. We know that he's good at adapting to the conditions in general. His race pace can be fairly solid. And he's pretty damn good at traffic management. At least, most of the time. So, this is my theory. Take him out of Formula 1 and push him into an Aston Martin Valkyrie in the World Endurance Championship. Now, I can already hear some of you saying that this would be a step down for Lance. Well, maybe in your world. But we're on the path toward the golden age of endurance racing. At least in the modern age. The top car manufacturers in the world with top level drivers now gunning for glory. And especially so with the 24 hour of Le Mans being around. Aston Martin are entering the fold for 2025. Lance would be a great fit for that squad. And Weck would be a great fit for him. But Josh, I hear you say. Formula 1 drivers are just a different breed, a step above the rest, no matter how mid they may be in Formula 1, and besides, how could you be sure that he'd be good? Okay, to say that anyone who's ever driven in Formula 1 is automatically better than anyone who didn't reach it is unbelievably misinformed. Like seriously, you're gonna tell me that Yuji Ide is a better driver than these guys? Get out of here. And on that lack of experience on Lance's part, I raise you the 24 hour of Daytona. He competed in 2016 and in 2018 and was said to have performed very damn well. Sure, it's only a couple of races, but he took to it like a duck to water. And if the Grandmaster plan were to work as um, planned and can bring home great results for Aston and Weck, it would immensely help the brand, not just in Weck, but the overall marquee in general. The point isn't about taking him down a notch or even eradicating him from Formula 1 just to get rid of him. It's about putting him in an environment where he could thrive. That's all any of this is. Because at the end of the day, the last thing we want is for an F1 team to vanish from the grid due to the endless, futile pursuit of one man trying to make his son a world champion in Formula 1. When ideally, perhaps more realistically, he could still be a world champion if only he steered the ship to slightly sunnier waters. That metaphor was incredibly mid.